I, I just took me back to pull it right there. Yeah. That's right. Sounds like this. Right with the wind. Cougar here. Can we see your number, sir? So we give you a proper introduction. The uh, Cougar, we could say, the Mercury Cougar, introduced uh, in the wake of the Ford Mustang success. Uh, you know, Ford saw what GM was doing with the Chevy Camaro, the Pontiac Firebird. They thought, well, why don't we introduce our own cousin to the Mustang in the way of the Mercury Cougar? And just as Mercury is a somewhat upscale version of the Ford, the Cougar is an upscale Mustang, I think it's fair to say. A little closer to Thunderbird, maybe, than Mustang. Uh, this particular Cougar is exhibited by Chris Mizzy, of, right here in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, I love the color name for this, Cinnamon Frost, which also sounds like it could be a tasty dessert treat. Yeah, I, would, I would like Cinnamon Frosting now that you say that, but yes, it's a, a wonderful name. And this is a car that kind of bridges the gap, as we say, between the Mustang Performance and the Thunderbird Luxury. So more refined, a little more livable, shall we say. And uh, I think the Mercury is kind of set apart by those disappearing headlights. This is sometimes referred to as the uh, electric shaver front end, right? It looks a little like one of those old Remington and Norelco razors, if you can picture it. And I think uh, this... Didn't, didn't Larry Tate on Bewitch drive a Cougar uh, during, during his tenure on the show? I think that might be the case here. I believe he did, an important point. Uh, Wraparound front and rear fenders on the car here as well. Triple taillights with sequential turn signals, which we had talked about earlier. Um, all vinyl bucket seats, a three-spoke steering wheel, deep loop carpeting, and a floor-mounted three-speed shifter were all standard on the Cougar, though options included air conditioning, bumper guards, an electric clock, tinted glass, and so on and so forth. We should note, uh, and forgive me if you touched on this while I was paying attention to something else here, Matt, but the GTs came standard with the 390 V8, uh, 320 horsepower to get you up to speed, uh, front disc brakes to help you get you back down, a special suspension package and a number of other little bits and pieces there. Uh, the rarest of all the Cougars that year, the 150 built, only about 5,700 came equipped with the GT equipment. And we have another Cougar that's joined us up front. Could we see your, your placard, sir, so we can introduce you? Oh, 390? The 68 Mercury Cougar brought to us by Mark and Judy Colwick of Wolverine Lake, Michigan. And uh, that again, just uh, shows you sort of the change to the, the Cougar over the model years there. And for 68, the biggest change was the addition of side marker lamps. And, and this is something that becomes important in the mid, especially into the late 60s. Safety appliances on automobiles, whether they're lamps, lights, or, or seat belts for that matter. And it, it's kind of shocking how, how late it was before safety became a serious concern in, in the automotive industry, or frankly in Washington, D.C., which ultimately stepped in and set some of these regulations. But 1968 was really yeah. the threshold. The automakers had to have a whole host of uh, standards in place, you know, different things from protrusions on dashboards to uh, collapsible steering columns. Okay any number of things that in some cases require really some major engine work, engineering work uh, to make cars comply. Yeah, and uh, as we uh, look at the, the car, we should mention the XR7 series of the Mercury, which was available. That added uh, special things like rocker panel moldings, special wheel covers, a deck lid medallions, and an XR7 badge, which came on the, uh, the roof pillars as well. And that would be your top-line Cougar. And then even above that, there was the XR7G, and this gets back to our racing theme. The G in the XR7G stood for Gurney, as in Dan Gurney, who was racing for Ford, both in Indianapolis and at Le Mans, for that matter. And I think the way he told the story is that uh, you know, Gurney's involvement with the design of the car was pretty much limited to posing for publicity photos, but nevertheless, having his name associated with the car gave you that racing connection. And we should be clear, we are talking of the XR7, not to be confused with the Mazda RX7. Very different automobiles, really nothing to do with one another. And the racing uh, series was the Trans Am racing. It wasn't just racing for Pontiac Trans Ams, it was a series really for all pony cars uh, in competition with one another. That's right, that's right. The Trans Am series springs out of the popularity of the, the pony cars. So, wonderful. Two beautiful examples here with these Cougars. Thank you. A couple of cool cats. And now for something completely different. I sure could use some fancy French mustard. I wonder where I might find it. 